Hyperangulated video laryngoscopy is a game-changing tool. In skilled hands, it can convert an intubation that would otherwise be impossible into something straightforward. But the converse is also true. It can take a straightforward intubation and make it very challenging in inexperienced hands. A lot of experienced airway operators still fall into the latter group. Our aim today is to make sure that's not you. Welcome to, Safe, welcome to Airwaves, the Safe Airway Society's, Society's live stream program. I'm your host, Nick Crimes, and today I'm joined by guest instructor Richard Cooper, who's going to help us with a hyperangulated video laryngoscopy virtual workshop. As always, we want these sessions to be interactive, so please put your comments if you're watching via YouTube, Periscope, or Facebook Live. You can put your comments in there, and we can put them up. If you've got questions for Richard, you can ask him, ask him live. We'll put up a number of resources afterwards on the Safe Airway Society website. I would just encourage you to support the Society by registering. Um, registering? Is that what you do? Join? No, joining the Society. Um, it's a non-profit society that's currently in the process of registering as a char charity and your support helps us to continue to provide these free educational, um, this free educational content. I just have a conflict of interest to declare. My partner works for Verithon, which is a manufacturer, one of the major manufacturer of um, video laryngoscopes. So you need to view everything I say through that prism. And I will now introduce our guest. Professor Richard Cooper is an anesthesiologist in Toronto in Canada. He is the, a faculty professor from the Difficult Airway Society for Airway Management. He's a past, past president of the Safe Airway Society, Safe Airway, sorry, <laughs> Society for Airway Management in the United in North America. He's a former the former director of the University of Toronto Advanced Airway Fellowship. Uh, he's also a member of the, the Project for Universal Management of Airways Working Group. He's performed over six thousand video intubations. I want to put that number in perspective for you. Looking, if you look at meta analyses of of intubations, they often have about seven hundred a thousand patients. A Cochrane group performed um, a few years back had about 7,000 patients across 64 randomised controlled trials. Now, half of those patients aren't video, video laryngoscopy. So Richard's experience, personal experience is about double that of the Cochrane review with video intubations. So it's quite extraordinary. Um, he's also, just to make the point that he's a well-rounded individual, he's also a, a, a baker of sourdough and a practiser of the violin. Um, please welcome to the show, Professor, Professor Richard Cooper. Hi, Richard. Hi, Nick. Thank you very much for that uh, kind uh, introduction. It's nice to be uh, in, in Melbourne again, um, although I preferred it, the circumstances more the last time I was there. By that, I mean I was, I was literally there, not virtually there. Um, the, yeah. I wanted to just ask you is, do you consider hyperangulated video laryngoscopy to be a core skill for independently practicing airway operators who have access to those devices? Uh, yes, I do. Okay. And that's really what makes this so important because my experience, I don't know about yours, Richard, is that that's. That's not how it's viewed by a lot of clinicians. They sort of see it as either they haven't taken to it, they don't really like it, or it's something they keep in the drawer if they need it. And because they use a video laryngoscope, usually they think they can just grab it on the fly. Um, but the technique is quite different, isn't it? Yes, I, I, that's really important to, to emphasize. And I, I think one of the problems is that many people who go to a Macintosh style video laryngoscope as their first choice and then resort to a hyperangulated blade as a rescue device, uh, don't really acquire the necessary skills to be confident and competent with it. So therefore, they, they're, they're more likely to fail in a failing airway. And, then, and they tend to blame that on, on the device itself rather than the technique. And is, is it fair to say that the, 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 in contrast to direct laryngoscopy, where most of the skill is in getting the view. And once you get a view, you've got line of sight and passing the tube. There can be some hiccups, but it's generally straightforward. With hyperangulated video laryngoscopy, it's the opposite, isn't it? The, the getting a view 
is straightforward. Getting the right view is requires some knowledge, but delivering the tube is where the, the skill really lies. Is that a fair comment? I, I think it's probably a fair comment, but the bigger the bigger challenge is basically unlearning some of the things that you've been accustomed to doing with direct laryngoscopy with a Macintosh style blade. Once you understand the differences in technique, there's nothing complicated about hyperangulated blades. And I, I, I would absolutely I'm, I'm able to convey that to you today. I would absolutely agree with you because we, we had this conversation about a bit over 12 months ago and Richard said to me, give me five minutes. And he's had the greatest impact of anyone on my practice of airway management because he's completely flipped much. me over. I was one of those people that said, you can see, but you can't get the tube in. This is a dangerous device. But now I think it's a fabulous device. Um, we've got with us today, Richard, a couple of um, trainees to, to sort of learn from you. Um, firstly, we've got Matt. He's an anaesthetic trainee. Uh, Matt, are you there? <laughs> What's going on with the camera? <laughs> okay, so I don't know what's happened there, but that, 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 that is Matt, who's deep undercover. And to his right there, I don't know who that is. Matt, who have you got with you? Is that an, one of the anaesthetic nurses, I think? We've got no sound. Have you got no sound, Matt? I think we're suffering from a poor internet connection there. Okay, well, hopefully we can sort that up. If you can try and rearrange your camera and we'll catch up with you in a little bit. Um, meanwhile, we'll let you to, leave you to watch um, Richard's workshop. And we've also got Carly and Curtis who are uh, uh, intensive care paramedic students. Hello. Hi, hi. Carly. Hi, Curtis. G'day, how you going? Okay, and again, we'll, 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 we'll leave you there to watch and we'll come back to you in a little while and um, get, you to, get you to demonstrate what, what you've learned have, and Richard can give you some feedback. Sounds great. Thank you. Okay, and with that out of the way, it's time for our virtual workshop. <laughs> okay, so Richard, now I like, you know I like a little flourish. <laughs> <laughs> Don't disappoint. Um, it, it takes us so long to get the timing even close to right with that. Um, so Richard, I think you wanted to start by deconstructing the technique without, without it in a mannequin initially, that we'll just talk through some of the points. Right. So I, I did this little sketch um, that we'll put up now. So you can see the sort of sagittal section and I've just marked the red line there is the primary curve and the blue line is the, the secondary curve. So if I just hold this up and try to get it to be roughly the right size, do you want to just talk through what we should be doing with the blade? Okay, I, I think to begin with, why don't we just contrast the technique with uh, conventional direct laryngoscopy yeah. using a Macintosh blade. I think what most people do who grab a laryngoscope blade is they introduce the blade deeply into the vollecula max right, and they pull upwards or toward the feet in order to optimize the laryngeal exposure. So when you do that with a hyperangulated blade, so just demonstrate what that's it into the vollecula. I guess that's hard for you to see and and then pull up in the manner you would if you were doing direct laryngoscopy. And what you do when you do that is you pull up on the laryngeal axis. So you deflect the the trachea so that it's oriented more toward the ceiling. I think if you could demonstrate that with the syringe the way you did before. Yeah. All right. Whoops. All right. So that's great. So that would be before you so, deeply. So you're saying as I lift, off. the trachea is doing this that's as well. Exactly. And you'll get a great view of the larynx and, and even the proximal trachea, but that makes directing the tube that much more challenging. So now let's let's correct the view uh, uh, or the, the way we would use the hyperangulated blade. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is just imagine, first of all, apply, you would be applying a, a slight film of a water-soluble lubricant along the blade so that the blade uh, sweeps smoothly across the tongue without pushing the tongue back. Then what I'm gonna ask you to do is rotate the, the laryngoscope around the base of the tongue and once you get to the base of the tongue, stop. Now, what I'd like you to do is try to yeah, let, let me just do that again tube. for you. 
at the base yeah. of the tongue until we uh, until the the distal aspect of the laryngoscope blade is more or less parallel with the floor perfect that's exactly where i'd like you to be now what i want you to do with the left hand is just vertically elevate the hand just lift up so you're all you're doing is not deflecting the larynx you're just you're just removing the obstruction caused by the tongue base. All right, now what we're going to be doing with, that's perfect. Now, you may not see the anterior commissure, but in my experience, people don't need to see the anterior commissure to successfully intubate. As, you, as long as you see a sufficient portion of the larynx, you sh you're fine. And that's, most of the time, that's going to be the bottom two thirds or the bottom uh, half of the larynx. Now with the right hand, we're going to take the, the uh, a styleted endotracheal tube. And what I suggested we try doing just to deconstruct this is demonstrate this with just the stylet itself. Yeah, I'm just trying to get the focus right. There we go. Okay. Um, so just so, so just to go through what we've done so far, we've got the blade in, we've rotated it around just to the base of the tongue, and then we've lifted slightly. And now I've got right. the stylet and I'm doing the same thing with that beside the tube, yeah? yeah? But okay, beside so the, the laryngoscope blade. So the stylet, if the stylet is right underneath the blade, then you're not gonna be able to perform the required maneuver. So what I'd like you to do is be close to the blade and parallel with the blade okay. in the same axis. Okay. So if I can just, now, just show this to be clear. So rather than coming in like this, you're wanting to come in like this. That's that right? exactly right. Right. Okay. That's... Now you've already got good laryngeal exposure. So now what you're doing with the left hand, and we'll, we'll show it better within the, in the mannequin in just a little while. So if you can just drop your left hand a tiny bit, your, sorry, your right hand, the, the left hand will actually be yeah. lifted sorry, a that, little bit. It right focuses hand. off the face. So. <laughs> there okay. we go. And the right hand, we're going to position it proximal to the larynx and yep. right in the middle. And, and we'll see that better from within, uh, inside the mannequin. But your right hand, all, the, the maneuver is very simple. All you're doing is elevating with the right hand. So just yep. lift slight, slightly and a yep. little bit of tilt, maybe 10 or 15 degrees in, uh, upward. That's it. Good. And... That will put the endotracheal tube right at the laryngeal orifice. And with one sort of two or three or four millimeters advancement, we're in, already in the proximal trachea, at which point we slide off the endotracheal tube. So can I just, can I just, sorry, go on, Richard. No, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, just to expand on what's going on, or my interpretation of what's going on, if you, um, with that, is that when you're, um, when you're coming, I, I, might, I don't, probably don't need the blade for this, but I think when, you, when you're coming, that, that manoeuvre that you talked about, which we'll show in a moment where you, sorry, I'll just do this to focus, um, where you're lifting up. This is the thing I've been calling on Twitter, the Cooper manoeuvre, um, pulling up along the axis of the, of the stilet. And that's quite an unusual manoeuvre. We don't usually do that. But my interpretation of what that's doing is, is our usually what we do is we tend to come in like this find we're below the trachea and then angle forwards and that means we're sort of either impacting the arytenoids or if we clear them we end up impacting the anterior wall of the trachea that this lifting maneuver is and and that slight angulation is bringing us more in line with the plane of the axis of the trachea and making it easier to enter is that is that what what it's achieving that's absolutely right nick but there's one other reason for doing that yeah. You can't angle the right hand because you've got the maxilla there. So your ability to manipulate that endotracheal tube is, is very limited. Yeah. So if you simply pull upwards, maybe, you know, one centimeter or so, that's all you need to do. I see. So if, you, if you're down below. here to get forwards, you start getting restricted by hitting the upper, the upper teeth there. Exactly. But if you pull up, yeah. you get that elevation relative to the larynx without impacting on the teeth. Exactly. Fantastic. Right. Okay, so what I'll do, let's let's try this out on a mannequin now. 
So can I, I thought what we just deconstructed a game so that yep. you demonstrate your maneuvers. Yep. So let me just get the video laryngoscope. Okay. Can we put the, the screen up of the video laryngoscope, please? Yep. So I'm do you want to just talk me through it, Richard? So lubing, sure. lubing the top of the blade, I found that's really useful, Richard. Although I found I people get very confused about... Regardless of the type of device I'm using, I, I, I do that routinely now. That, that's worth pointing out, is that the way we're using these blades, but what you're saying is generally applicable to all hyperangular blades, isn't it? Any, you, oh, sorry. The technique, yes. The lubrication, I, I apply that with any laryngoscope, hyperangulated, right. Macintosh, direct or indirect. All right. Um, I found that it's particularly in the afternoon when they've got a dry mouth, it's, um, it's yeah. very useful. What I've found is that people get very confused about what's the top of a hyperangulated blade for some reason. I thought that was obviously that, but I, every time I do it, someone lubricates what I would call the bottom, I think because they hold it like this. Yeah. Um, okay, so just, just chat me through. So we're putting okay. the... Design version. Yeah. Standing up straight, not because you don't have to look in the mouth. Yeah. Look in the mouth as you put the stylet in. So uh, advance yeah. this around the base of the tongue. Yeah. And stop. Now, what I would try to do at this point is just optimize the lo the position of the laryngoscope blade so that your that the your um, the triangle formed by the vocal cords, the uh, the anterior and posterior commissures are more or less vertical. So now a little bit of elevation with the left hand, not angulation. Yeah. And, and that's pretty good. Now let's take the styleted stylet or the styleted end. I've just got the stylet for the have. moment. Okay, now insert that you're what looking in the mouth, not on the not on the yep. screens. Okay, now watch the insert the advance. Now you look at the screen and yep. deliberately Pull that back a little bit so that you're proximal to the larynx and yeah. you're right in the center with the with the arytenoids um, right between the two arytenoids. Perfect. Okay, now with the right hand, just slight elevation in the center and then yeah. elevation. Now, uh, you've got to be a little Perfect. closer to the larynx. Yeah. Good. Now, elevation and tilt. Okay. Let's try that again. Let me, let me just do that. I'm sort of struggling with everything being on a funny angle here. Um, okay, so we, we're center there. This, this definitely demonstrates the advantage of having your screen in front of you, Richard. I've got it off in a weird space and it's giving me problems. Okay, so getting that center. So we're between the, between the arotenoids, before the arotenoids and below the arotenoids. And then right. we're implementing the, the Cooper maneuver lifting that's, and then angula it. angulating straight that's forward. That's it. Okay. Shall I do it with the, I'll do it. Shall I just do a sort of fluid one with the um, tube now just to show what it should look like? You can, if you want to show off. <laughs> I'm not sure that it'll be showing off. We'll see what happens. But, you know, but having said that, Nick, I would really encourage yeah. people to do it in a deconstructed manner until they're comfortable. Yeah, so that, that's just to demonstrate what you're ultimately aiming for and that it's not a slow yeah. technique. I, I now find it faster than doing direct laryngoscopy. Um, okay, so that's really the, the basic steps. So mi midline insertion, um, positioning the... Positioning the stylet, stylated tube in the midline, below the arotenoids, between the arotenoids and, and proximal or before the arotenoids, and then doing the Cooper maneuver, which I'll just demonstrate here on screen for everyone, because this is really the, the critical part of it, and it's not an intuitive maneuver, because we don't usually ever lift a tube like that. We usually do this, uh, and that's the thing. And you can see, can see there, um, maybe go to the close-up if we can on the other shot, yeah. So you can see there that when you bring that in and, and bring that in between the cords and then, and so 
we're between below before and then we do the Cooper manoeuvre and we just come up and now you're much more in the plane of the, the larynx without impacting on the maxilla and then that angulation forwards and it, it just goes in. And then the, the, the next step, Richard, do you have any tips? I sort of do a bit of a, a shuffle here where I like to pull that back to like, and you can see I can just see the, the um, tip of the, that ball on the tip of the stylet there and then advance that forward and then, then I grab that there and pull it out. And the, the pulling out's quite important too, isn't it, Richard? The, 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 the movement for using, taking the stylet out. If you're using the rigid glide right stylet, it's important to realize that what you're doing is doing a kind of a reverse rotation, pulling it out toward the feet, not pulling it straight back. Yeah, so it's, it's coming, coming out like this yes that's right okay now, whereas I, the tendency is sorry richard go no i was just going to say you're demonstrating this with the let, let's talk just a little bit about the curve on the stylet yeah because in my original publication and in most of the publications that have appeared subsequent to that they talk about shaping the the stylet to conform to the laryngoscope blade and i i I think we did a poor job of describing that because although it conforms to the very distal tip, a lot of people end up having a huge angulation on their blade, like mm. and, and on sorry on the on the stylet, and that only complicates things because you get too anterior in your delivery and you get engaged on the anterior tracheal wall. So what I do, I describe it now as kind of like a droopy J, and I use a malleable stylet. 90%, uh, 95% of the time, I use the glide right or the stylet that comes with the with this with the uh, glide scope, primarily to teach people this is the shape that I'm trying to achieve. So you can use either. So when you say a droopy J, when you're using the malleable stylet, then I'm getting the impression you would have a slightly less curve than this, on the rigid stylet. Is that right? I'm perfectly happy with with the um with the shape of that that stylet but when i do it i i tend to be a little less um, angulated than that but not not significantly that shape will work perfectly well okay um but you can do exactly the same thing if you don't have access to these rigid stylets you can do exactly the same thing by by shaping a, a malleable stylet and yeah. achieve exactly the same result and I think it's also important to mention um, be, mention that the, the tip of the stylet should not protrude beyond the, the endotracheal tube. So I'll just try and show that there that that's, that's not very well focused, but you can see that the, the stylet, there you go, the stylet's inside the end of the tube. And then, and then as you're getting to the, um, whoops, as you're getting to the, um, uh, chords as you and you're really only putting sort of that far between the chords aren't you and then I start to shuffle that back so that this gets the flexibility to do that downward turn along the axis of the trachea and then once you get the tube into that point where it's at the the lines on the tube then the then the stilet comes out and as I was saying to you yesterday Richard I I find um, that it's actually easier to do a lot of this myself so you, you notice I once I get the tube in, I will slide that off. Oops, sorry. See, this is why it's not showing off, Richard. There you go. And then I grab the tube there so that I can actually pull that out myself. Okay. Um, because I find if you've got a very well-trained assistant with you, as I might have in theatre, um, th then that's fine to let someone assist you. But if I'm called to a difficult intubation on, on the ward, or in the emergency department where the person assisting me may be less experienced with a hyperangulated blade, I find it useful. That, that's quite difficult to explain in a time critical situation what you want there. And, and the, the dangers of just pulling, pulling this up, Richard? The, oh, <laughs> you'll, you'll end up doing a sagittal split. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it will not come out easily that way. But it comes yes. out very easily if you just uh, do a kind of a uh, roll it out in a reverse fashion. Yeah, and what what because it gets stuck, people tend to pull harder and harder and jerk, and then can no potentially dislodge the tube. And, 
Exactly that. And so I would leave the laryngoscope in until my stylet is out, confirming yeah. the position of the, uh, that the endotracheal tube is still properly placed. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to show you a couple of other things. I don't know if you've seen this, this device. This is something we have. Have you, have you seen this? This is a curved bougie with a steerable tip. I have. Um, I haven't, I haven't used it. I've, I've, I've seen it in the literature. I don't so think I'll it's just, available in North America, but I could be wrong. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'll just show you um, with this, and this is quite a nice device too. That the technique is really exactly the same in terms of getting the the view. Um, bringing this in, and again with this steer, steerable tip, what I tend to do is as soon as it comes into the picture, is I flex it up because I find because you've got no depth perception here. If you try to advance it and then flex it up, you can find yourself actually behind the arotenoids by the time you flex up. So as soon as it comes in, I flex it up, advance it into the trachea, and then flex it down so it follows the axis of the trachea, and then just slide that in, and then you just load your tube on. And I've found that's a really nice device, and it has the, the benefit of, if you're getting a sort of obscured view of the cords, is you don't have the whole diameter of the tube there, you've just got, got the bougie. Um, can I just can I just tackle you about use of a Frover bougie? This is one of my my pet peeves in um, in Australia. I don't know if it's true true in Canada or North America. The a lot of a lot of anaesthetists like to just get this out of the packet straight, coil it, and then then use this. And what it what it does is it sort of dynamically unfurls as a as you're trying to um, intubate and I think I think one of the problems with it is it, it can be done but the longer it takes you to intubate the further away the tip of the, the bougie gets from where you want it to be so it's not a robust technique to me what you want is a technique that works in the most difficult difficult airway not only in the most most straightforward difficult airway what are your thoughts on using a, a, a straight a straight bougie for for a hyperangular blade I Personally, I, I don't honestly feel the need for it. Uh, I think the number of the number of times that I get a grade three or grade four grade three view is uh, probably less than a half a percent. If I could fit the laryngoscope in the patient's mouth, so uh, I, I I would prefer to advance the endotracheal tube under visual control. Uh, rather than to railroad a device over uh, an endotracheal tube over a, a, a over an introducer, yeah. Um, so the, I the haven't other... felt the need for it, uh, and I'm I'm reluctant to say anything uh, negative about the Frova device because uh, Julio Frova is one of my closest friends. No, it's um, but but it's not. I think the the point is it's you know we all use this and it's a fantastically useful device. But it's not purpose designed for the hyperangulated blade, and I think one of the the traps we fall into is trying to MacGyver our existing equipment to fit new stuff. And I think you know when you can use something like even just a malleable stylet that, that everyone has access to, and it's just just much more fit for purpose, isn't it? Can I? I'll show you one more thing. I don't, I don't know where I got this from, but just to sort of so I'm not monopolising devices. This is a a a, a stilet that's very similar to the, the glide right, but I don't know if you can see there, it's got a sort of steerable tube. It looks like it's a, a laparoscopy bit of equipment. There. I have one on my desk here too. Oh, you've got that too. Have you, I, I haven't used this clinically. I don't think this is licensed here. I think it was given to me at a conference. Is that something you've used? No. no. Same, same thing for me. Okay. Uh, Nick, to be honest, I, I don't, personally, I have not found that these devices are essential when with with this technique that I've described, yeah, I, I, I must say, like as simple as possible. So I, I have to agree. I, I was using a lot of different things before I was shown your technique, and now now I go for the stellet. I must say, I, I tend to use the the rigid stellet rather than the, the malleable one, okay. um, but I find I find I have more control. And another thing that's probably worth getting your thoughts on that we we probably didn't weren't explicit about is is how to hold this. Um, so I think a lot of people, and the way we usually hold a tube with direct laryngoscopy is sort of halfway down, but I've been holding it, I can't remember if you taught me this or someone else, 
holding it at the top. Um, and that seems to give me, with, with all the maneuvers we've done and doing the Cooper maneuver, it seems to be much easier to control it and, and deliver it. Um, and also gives you, when, when you're using this, the opportunity with one hand without moving your hand and potentially dislodging the tip of the, the tube to, to, to withdraw the stellet as well. Is, is that how you would, you would hold it, Richard? That, that's, how I, that's how I do it, but I've never yeah. systematically studied the different techniques. Uh, with uh, where you'll hold, uh, as far as holding the uh, device. Can I just emphasize the importance of looking in the mouth as you advance the endo, as you insert the endotracheal tube to avoid soft tissue injury? It's not the device, it's, it's not the stylet, it's the technique that causes those soft tissue injuries. Now you were saying you don't, you don't need to look in the mouth when you're inserting the blade, presumably because you have that vision on the screen, is that right? Well, I, I watch the tip of the blade going. I'd hate to be putting it in the patient's nose. Yeah. So I watch the <laughs> I watch the laryngoscope as it goes uh, in the mouth, but then I turn my attention to the screen. Yeah. I advance the the, to, the laryngoscope to an appropriate position. Then I take my stylated endotracheal tube and I look in the mouth as I'm inserting it and advancing it until it appears on the screen. Yeah. So we've got. Uh, Sorry, keep going. No, and then I just optimize the laryngoscope and the relationship between the, the left hand and the right hand. So I position that my image is vertical, vertically oriented, and very often people will be slightly to the side. And so that it's, it's like trying to, trying to insert an endotracheal tube tangentially. And I'd, I'd rather have face the, the uh, larynx directly on so that it's, okay. it's properly centered. So it's it's look in the mouth, look at the screen, look in the mouth, look at the screen, exactly. position, lift, tilt, Perfect. shuffle, um, and I get a bit of hang up here, which is really manic and hang up. Plastic on plastic. Beautiful. Okay, Very so nice. if anyone's watching and you've got any questions for Richard about the basics of the technique, let us know, and we'll put them up on the screen, and and Richard can answer them for us. Um, shall we, I think Richard, maybe we might go to our trainees and just see, oh, hang on, here's a lifting with a styloted hand rather than pull back and restrict your view by pulling the blade back. So I think, I think this is a question about, people talk about getting a deliberately poor view of the larynx. Um, and that, that's not something you've, you've, you've mentioned that you might end up with a poor view but you've not mentioned that as a, as a goal. Is that right? Um, or a compromised view? I, I think, as, as I said before, that um, I think most of us are accustomed to deeply engaging the vollecula and, uh, and maximizing laryngeal exposure. And that tends to make the use of a hyperangulated blade more complicated than it needs to be. And actually that may be a setup for for uh, for failure, so my initial insertion is the the laryngoscope blade will be at the base of the tongue with elevation, not angulation, and I generally don't have to pull back, but sometimes I do pull back. Well, you've con converted a tough audience there with Professor Rosenblatt. I don't know if you can see those. W Will's going to try I, try the malleable stylet. Well, I'm um, I'm honored. I'm can I just say, with with that close close up view, if you can, we just put the um the video laryngoscope screen up. If you imagine those those numbers on the syringe are the tracheal rings, with that sort of intuitive view you go for, where you deeply engage the the um blade, what you're getting is um, a close up view where you're looking up at the larynx and between the cords you're seeing tracheal rings and the trachea is sort of filling the screen. By doing what Richard's suggesting um, and, and, and really keep keeping your blade back here, what you're getting is the, the larynx in the upper half of the screen, you may have a, um, a sort of compromised view with a bit of epiglottis dropping down, giving you a grade two view, but you're looking more down, more down into the larynx and getting more, seeing more of the axis of the trachea. Is that, is that a fair description of what those changes are doing, Richard? I, I think that's that's true, but your right hand, your left hand, 
part. Now your right hand has actually got the blade angulated upward. But yeah, I'm I'm sort of can't work out what I'm uh, doing. Uh, yeah, you but, reversed but your think, hand. So that, and and the that, other the other like, thing here, so, sorry, Richard. No, you you you've explained that uh, very clearly. I think the other thing that's really important here is that that wide view lets you see where you're coming from. I think. This looks like a great view if you're not familiar with what you're doing, but you can't a you can't see where your tube is coming from, and b you can't get it into the coolers because your laryngoscope is actually obstructing the airway. Yeah. Um, so we've got a, I've got another question there from the audience. Sometimes when I get a nice view, a grade one view, it turns out to be a difficult situation, a nice view but can't proceed the tube in. I think we've just discussed what the reason for that is, isn't it? It's it's that that pulling back changes the angle of angle of approach. So Will is now telling yeah. Richard what he's saying. <laughs> so, uh, so John Sackles is out there as well. Very help helpful to lubricate the sullet and the inside of the ETT. That, that's another really important point. We mentioned lubricating the top of the blade, but also lubricating the stilet before you put it in the tube, because otherwise you again get that friction and, and that puts you at risk of pulling it out. Is that right, Richard? Uh, well, if, if I, I, as I said, I use mostly the Malincroft satin slip, uh, I malleable see. and I haven't found it I haven't found it to be necessary to lubricate the stylet. I think if you're using the rigid glide, right, then it may, may very well be helpful. And I take anything I hear from John Sackles with uh, significant, uh, consideration. He's a man of few words, but they're, they're high yield words. They're important words. Um, so another comment there, once sitting on the arotenoids, I usually find, so this is once you've passed the tube through the glottis, I usually fly sticking the stylet out slightly with the thumb makes the tube easy to pass. So again, I think that's the, the idea of shuffling the tube back, stuff, shuffling the stylet back to allow the distal part to, to, to turn. Well, I, I deliberately try not to, to, not to touch the arotenoids not to touch the vocal cords, but to insert the, uh, maybe we're just, uh, maybe I'm just finessing the point, but I try to make as little contact with the, the vocal cords as I can, or the arotenoids. Okay. Uh, the other thing I'll say, Richard, that I've realized as I've practiced this is, is, as you say, we've deconstructed it to consciously do this lift, but I've realized that what I'm actually doing is rather than hugging the back of the pharynx, I'm trying to stay to close to the tongue as a, as I come around, exactly. and that sort of brings you automatically into that position. And as you say, because you're up high, you're actually above the arotenoids because of your angle of approach. Yeah. Um, once again, plastic on plastic. Anyway, pretend I got that in. <laughs> the um, we might just quickly go to the trainees, Richard, I think, and ask them to to, to run through, and if they've got any questions, and then we'll come back and do some troubleshooting about. Co common problems people have and how we might overcome them and, you, and you've got some other things you you want to discuss if we get time uh, once again anyone watching if you've got if you've got questions for Richard um, please please put them in the comments on YouTube Periscope or Facebook live uh, we might cross over to um, Carly and Curtis who are our intensive care paramedic students do, do you guys have any questions for Richard about about the technique he's demonstrated uh, no, it's great. It's a it's a different way than what we've been taught at uni. So it's uh, yeah, it's really interesting that coming coming straight up and then angling back. It's it's very good. Thank you. Okay, Curtis, do you want to have a crack? Sure. Do you want any, um, we've got a because on road we use a um the formable style out, so maybe we'll go with that. That's all right. Yep, sounds good. Now we're we're only judging you. <laughs> yeah. No worries. Thank you. <laughs> Beautiful. Now I would ask I I would ask Carly to remove the stylet while you're while you're holding the endotracheal tube. Ask my partner to do it for me. Need me. <laughs> Too good. The, the other thing we did have the question we did have is inflation of the balloon prior to the removal of the stylet. I think like in an intubation on road and a kind of an uncontrolled home setting. Is it safer to have the balloon inflated before the stylet comes out, just in case you do dislodge it, or would you still recommend the stylet coming out prior to the inflation of the balloon? Um, I, I, 
I don't, I don't have a comment on that. If you find that in your practice, it, if the tube is more secure with, with inflation prior to removing the stylet, go ahead. And, I, uh, I will contact, say, in a pre-hospital setting. Yeah, in a pre-hospital setting. Well, that, that may be more, uh, it may be safer to do it that way. It, it, would make, it would make sense in a rapid, rapid sequence intubation, Richard, to just put the cuff up as, as soon as you can anyway, regardless of anything to do with video laryngoscopy, wouldn't it? It's just once the tube's in place, you'd want the cuff up straight away. I'm, I'm sorry, I was distracted. What oh, sorry, was I was again? saying... I uh, saying it would make, make sense doing rapid sequence intubation a, apart from anything related to video laryngoscopy is that once you've confident you've got the tube in the trachea that the cuff should go up to protect the trachea as soon as, as, soon as possible. Yeah, I agree. The, the other thing I will say, Curtis, and, and, this, and this applies to an elective setting too, and, and we've sort of skipped this because I don't have enough hands to inflate cuffs and things, but one of the things I've found really useful about using the hyperangulated blade is that I leave the blade in once I've placed the tube if I'm not doing a rapid sequence intubation, and I actually watch watch while I inflate the cuff to make sure it's not herniating above the cords or that it hasn't yep. moved since I put it in. Um, and I found that really useful to be able to visualize the tube and, and be really a lot more deliberate about tube positioning than you, than you are potentially with a, with a direct laryngoscope. Um, okay. Carly, did you want to have a go? Yep, yeah, if that's all right, we've got time. Mm. Might as quickly, uh, Very nice. I would like to draw attention to Carly's perfect posture while doing video laryngoscopy. <laughs> you know, you're standing upright and, and the patient is properly positioned in, in relationship to you. Much lower than if you were doing direct laryngoscopy. Right. Thank you. Th Very thanks, nice guys. Well, well done. J just, just hang around if you're able and we'll, we'll chat to you a bit more at the end maybe. Um, we'll go over to Matt. I just, I just before we go to Matt, I just want to say one of the reasons we did this this way, Richard, is in 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 particularly in the time of COVID at the moment, um, people are looking for ways to teach technical skills virtually. So one of the the ideas you and I had was to was to do this. So I think I think what we've demonstrated there is that you can effectively teach technical skills remotely if you can get people set up with the right kit at the other end. So one of the, we've just done this with two two remote sites today, which everyone told me was too many, but, um, and we may have lost one anyway, but what we might do um, if this works is actually run a, 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 not a, not a public, but run a private um, live stream, a private online um, virtual workshop for, for more people, not, not roping Richard into that necessarily, but, but through the, through the Safe Airway Society. So that's something we'll be looking at doing um, later on, if any of you want to do. Our good friend, Eleanor Sullivan is there. Is this technique applicable to all hyperangulated video scopes? Um, have you experienced with the D-Mate on C-Mac and the X-Blade on McGrath? Richard? Absolutely applicable. Um, I, have, I have considerable experience with the D-Blade on the C-Mac. Uh, I have experience with the McGrath Series 5, not with the X-Blade on the McGrath Mac. Um, so the, the technique is exactly the same with the other devices. The, uh, the, the it's easier to demonstrate this technique with the glide scope because the terminal portion of the blade is flat and the concept of trying to insert the blade so that the terminal portion is parallel with the floor is easier to demonstrate with the glide scope than with the other blades. But the technique is the same. Thanks for that question. You, you've just reminded me of something, Richard, that, that we were, well, that I was wrestling with yesterday and I've been percolating on your, your answer. Um, we were talking about the size blade you would use 
where the, the CMAC is just in one side, but the Glidescope adult blades come in a, a three and a four. Um, and you were saying that you recommend, and I know um, Louise Ellard, who was your your fellow a few years back, who who did a live stream recently, she also has has recommended the three. Um, do you want to just run through why why you would default to a, th a three blade? Okay. Um, my preference for using a smaller size blade, I, I, I make the decision about blade size based on the patient's length rather than their body weight. Uh, if I were intubating a professional basketball player, I would definitely go for a longer blade. If I was intubating the, a typical size adult, I would go for a shorter blade or, uh, or uh, you, most of the time it's a three. Uh, the reason for that is the blade is less likely to be deeply inserted and it's more likely to be positioned where I've recommended at the base of the tongue. If you go for a four and just retract your blade a little bit, um, I think what that means is your camera is more recessed from the larynx and you're less likely to get the kind of laryngeal exposure that I'm accustomed to. So I really don't see the advantage to going to a, um, a, uh, a number four in the average size, the average height um, uh, adult. So I think, I think that's interesting because I was saying to you yesterday that I, I've been using the four, but I haven't really been able to work out why. And nearly everyone I know who's, who's sort of expert with this has recommended the three. And, and that last point you made really made the difference. So I've lined those two blades up there so that the cameras are at the same level. The cameras of both are there, but the camera to tip distance is much longer with the four than with the three. And that, and that camera to tip part of the Glidescope blade is flat. And so I think if I'm right, Richard, is what you're saying is, because my argument was with the longer blade, if I put the tip in the same place, what's the difference? But what that means is, that there's a lot more flat blade in there, I'm getting less access to the hyperangulated blade, which is what I'm trying to use yeah. it for, and you tend to be looking behind again. That's my feeling as well. Yeah, no, I think, and it's, I, you know, for me, it's, I always love to be able to explain why. So that, that's been really reassuring. There's another question up there. Um, I thought rather than lifting the structures, it's better to tilt the blade to get that suboptimal view. Now, we should just make the point we're not. So there, there is an initial slight lift with the, with the left hand, but the, the main lift is coming from the right hand with the stellette rather than trying to lift the airway with the blade. That's right, isn't it, Richard? There, there is a lift with the left hand as well. The left hand is retracting the tongue base, but making a deliberate effort not to angulate the, the larynx or increase the angulation on the laryngeal axis. So I think there is some elevation with the with the left hand as well. So I, I think what that 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 question was about was, and I know I've seen George Kovach and Adam Law talk about this. Is is that if you're in too far, that to get back to the right position, I think they talk about rotating the blade, um, withdrawing the blade, and lifting the blade slightly to get back to the the sort of and position. I completely agree. And I think I think we're probably saying the same thing. So so I think what you're talk what what that that question is about the idea of withdrawing and tilting. That's really a corrective move maneuver because you've put the blade in too far. What you're teaching is not to get to that point in the first place. I think so, but we're always going to be uh, uh, making some adjustments, subtle adjustments, trying to get the proper orientation of the the larynx so that we're not. Uh, approaching it tangentially, making sure that they're vertical as opposed to uh, angulated. So it, it may also involve some retraction and, and uh, redirection of our lifting maneuver. So I, I have no trouble with those corrective maneuvers. Yeah, certainly. And can I ask you another question? This is a controversial one. I think, I think um, you and Tim Cook have different views on this about the head and neck position for hyperangulated video laryngoscopy. Right seems to be an area of controversy. Can you, can you just tell us what, what you advocate and why? Okay, for most patients, I don't think it makes a difference. I started altering my, um, uh, my practice when I encountered patients with, very, with, with either short necks, uh, reduced cervical extension, very large breasts or, hype, or, or massive obesity, 
where in trying to insert the hyperangulated blade, the handle would abut on the patient's chest. And so to try to correct that, I would remove the patient's pillow so that their head was in a neutral position. And I found that when I was doing indirect laryngoscopy, this did not compromise my laryngeal view at all. So I've actually taken, I changed my practice so that I was doing this as a matter of routine. It's not a big deal for the majority of patients. Um, it becomes an issue when you have patients with that, where you can't get the blade into the, into the patient's mouth because the handle abuts on the patient's chest. That's, that's a function of the, the, the distance between, I think you can demonstrate that on the mannequin. Do you, do you understand what I mean? Yeah, so, so sorry, just, I vagued out a bit when you said which actual position you were gonna use. So you're, you're in a sniffing so, position or a neutral position? So I, I, I would, I put my patients in, the patients who have those, one or more of those difficulty, those challenges, a big chest, very large breasts, re, a short neck, reduced cervical extension, I find that when I, if, they, if their head is elevated on a pillow, the part, the proximal part of the handle will often abut on the patient's chest, exactly. Yeah. And by dropping their head, i.e. by taking the pillow out, that's less of a problem. It gave me, gives me several extra centimeters of space. But wouldn't, and I wouldn't dropping their head down, up. wouldn't dropping their head down, so then you're, in, in dropping their head down, and sort of reversing the sniffing position, or what Tim and I would call flextension, um, you're flexing the atlanto-occipital joint and extending the base of the neck. I would have thought that would bring the chest up closer to the blade, and that, that no, putting someone in the sniffing position would lift everything away from the chest. Well, all I'm doing is some atlanto-axial extension and less right. anterior flexion of the lower cervical spine. Okay. I'm putting so, the pillow up. So you're not so necessarily in a neutral. So you're not sorry. You're not necessarily in a neutral position. You're right. you've just got neutral at the base of the neck, but you're extending the top of it at the AO joint. Yeah, that's that's okay. right. So my 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 only comment in relation to that would be is if there's not much difference. This is just my thoughts. Is that we should be positioning for airway rescue as well. And if for some reason you can't intubate with the hyperangulated blade being in a sniffing position for face mask ventilation or maybe supraglottic airway insertion might be advantageous. So my preference is to start in that position if it doesn't make a big difference to the hyperangulated blade. I think it, particularly with face mask ventilation, it, it, makes, it can make a huge difference. I think in 99% of patients, it's not gonna make a difference. It's just those circumstances that I described where insertion yeah. of the blade, the handle of butts on the chest. Okay, let's go to, to go to Matt and see if we've got a picture that isn't, oh, much better. And who have you got, who's there with you, Matt? This is Alyssa. Alyssa, hi, Alyssa. Um, so so one, I, with, with both of these things, I got the assistance in too, Richard, because I think, I think it's important to stress that training for this is not just about training the airway operator, it's about training the whole airway team and making sure the assistant knows what you're doing so that you can work um, cooperatively when you when you're doing this, um, Matt and Alyssa, have you got any questions for Richard about the about the technique? We've got no sound again. I don't think. We're, we're going to assume you haven't got any questions because we can't hear you. Okay. okay. <laughs> do you do you want do you want to just run us run us through? Now I think we're just dealing with plastic yeah, on plastic. Yeah, I, th I think what you're seeing there is a bit of friction from the plastic. It's very hard to get the mannequin lube down that distally. Um, but you, his approach is coming a little bit from the left. And I would, I would have tried, this is, I, I'm finessing the point here, but I would try to 
just change the angle slightly on the laryngoscope so that it's more, uh, uh, so that it, you're not intubating tangentially. I don't know if that makes sense to you, Matt. Does that, do you want to have one, one more go, Matt? It was, it's really a very minor uh, recommendation. Because we really want you to leave on a high here, Matt. So just taking that deliberate time, Richard, you're saying to get, get, get everything in the midline. Yep. Oh, you can see that how that Cooper maneuver makes such a difference to your angle of approach. Very, very nice. Great. Beautiful. Nicely done, Mark. Oh, beautiful. You know, one and thing that excellent. we... Excellent. Sorry, Richard. Nick, one thing that we, we... One of the troubleshooting things that we can cover very quickly is the patient with a small mouth. Yep. In whom, in whom there's difficulty fitting the laryngoscope and the endotracheal tube in uh, and not feeling very crowded. So can I ask you to demonstrate this technique, Matt? Yeah, sure. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk you through it. If you can put the stylet back in the endotracheal tube. Matt, if put you... Put the stylet back in the endotracheal tube. Put, put the stylet back in the tube. Oh, maybe I'll do it, Richard. I think they're okay. struggling with sound. Sure. Yeah. All right. Okay. So just while I remember, Richard, there are, there are three three issues I wanted to talk about. Actually, one relates to position. We were talking about um, uh, sniffing position or flextension versus neutral. Um, we've talked a little bit about um, shuffling the the stilet out of the tube to, to get it to feed. Um, the, the other thing is that the the idea of of rightwards rotation. So when we're when we're doing direct laryngoscopy and you get hang up above the cords, we tend to rotate anti-clockwise to get the bevel to clear at the back. But if you're getting hang up below the cords with the hyperangulated blade, you're really wanting to do the opposite, aren't you? And get that bevel to clear at the front and rotate to the right. Um, well, usually by the time you've removed the stylet, yeah, I, I guess I, by, uh, I'm thinking back into my own practice when I, have that when I have had that problem, I've rotated the tube, I've turned the tube clockwise, so it is to the right. Yeah, so so, just, so just, just to make that clear to the audience, when you're, I'm not sure if I can get a good picture of this, but if you, um, I really need to do it like that. If you look at your tube, no, it's too hard to see, but the bevel's over here on the left, and if the, you're impacting on the arotenoids here, if you rotate anti-clockwise, the bevel can now clear the arotenoids, but if you're below the cords, then you need to go right because you now want that bevel at the front to clear it. So it's just a finessing point that I've found since using your technique, I haven't really needed to do much, but it's yeah. it's worth being aware of. So I, I sort of remember that, and this, this may be a Rich Levitan thing, um, left at the larynx, right at the rings to sort of remember which way to rotate. And the other thing is that if I've, there was one particular time I can remember where I was getting, well, actually a trainee where I was with was getting hang up below the cords and she just couldn't advance it despite doing anything. And we just flexed the head slightly. So flexed the Atlanta occipital joint and it was just popped in. Again, that, I imagine that sort of flattening out that secondary curve a bit and allowing, allowing it to move forwards. Is that something you've tried, Richard? Uh, I have. I, I just I put my right hand under the patient's head and just lift. But I think yeah. that rotation of the endotracheal tube, like the clockwise rotation, I describe it as kind of like putting in an epidural where you get loss of resistance. And as you rotate the tube, it disengages, and you, you're not even pushing. You just feel it suddenly pop forward. It's funny you say that because that was the exact the exact analogy I used. It was like getting loss of resistance with it. You just felt it go. Uh, and that was exactly right. I was sort of hung up like this and I couldn't do it. I went that and it just, it just sort of, well, the train needed just dropped in. I was standing there. It was very much like that. So you were saying you wanted to talk about the situation where you can't get the blade into the mouth because you've got limited mouth opening, Richard. Or the combination of the blade and the endotracheal tube. It yep. just seems. Yeah. So if we can just go to the, the close-up view here. Oh, hang on, I'll just, Richard, I've got a question from John. Um, if you had a choice between a glide scope hyperangulated, here we're getting very industry focused, 
glide stroke hyperangulated blade and a CMACD blade, which would you choose and why? I, I, you know what? I'm going to avoid that question. I think the difference between them is very slight. And uh, uh, the, it, it's far, I, I think the, the difference between a Macintosh style blade and a hyperangulated blade is far more important to consideration than the difference between the D blade and the, and the glide scope. Um, I mean, the, so the study, the study has been done compare. It was a non-equivalent study done by Michael Aziz and colleagues. And they found that the two blades were not equivalent, but the difference between them was not all that important. And it, it actually did favor the glide scope over the CMAC, even though it was a study that was, that was uh, funded by Stortz. Um, Michael Zaid, sorry, Richard. Michael Zaid, who was a... Michael Zaid was a consultant who trained me when I was a registrar many years ago um, and, and has offered me some pearls that I still practice to this day. Uh, would a Kessel modification of the, the VL handle, the hyperangulated VL handle, overcome the obesity issue? I, I've asked this too, the idea of a, like what I've called a sickle blade, where, you, where if the blade was sort of, the handle was angled up from the blade, because you're not needing the mechanics of that to lift like you are with a Mac blade. Yeah. What, are, what are your thoughts on that? This this is a I had suggested the same thing when the GlideScope first came out as a prototype. Uh, this, I referred to it not as a Kessel modification, but the one that we that was originally developed for for patients in an iron lung. The polio it, blade. A polio blade. That's right. So um, I'm not sure if that's the same thing as the Kessel modification. But this is a Sorry. problem that, that's pretty uncommon. So I, I mean, I, I'm not sure that there's a need for that kind of modification, but it's, a, it's, it's something that I had thought about myself. Or, yeah, so, so that, about don't you like the name sickle blade? <laughs> you know, I'm all about the, all about the language. Um, the, we're in that situation, you can just put the blade in sort of sideways to avoid that. Um, That's what I used to do that. Yeah. And then there was a report of a blade. It was, it was a stat blade. And the stat blades are not as robust as the current blades. So that's one of these, the, uh, the older yeah. sort of traditional glide scope blades. And, and the blade broke. And I'd also be concerned about the potential for dental injury. So the suggestion that I'm going to make rather than... Uh, rather than changing the angle of the blade, is insertion of the endotracheal tube first under visual control. Okay, can we just go to the close-up view, thanks. Yep, so I'm putting the, the blade, the, the, the tube in first blindly. The Stop. Yep. Okay, now put the lowering, slide the endotracheal tube over to the right, create yep. space. Yep. And now put now. the luring in. And very often what you find is you're all, it's embarrassing yeah. how often you're already at the laryngeal orifice. So now and I can just do like a bit of a Cooper maneuver and I'm yeah. in. And, you're in. and a lot of people I've showed that technique to, I didn't, I didn't, I'm not the inventor of that technique, but when I was first shown that technique and I, I demonstrated it to other trainees, they found it so useful that they adopted that as their routine. Routinely putting the, the tube in first. Yeah. The advantage of that is that you're a direct, you, you have no, no other thing to watch other than the insertion of the endotracheal. Or a second advantage is that, you're, you've, that forces you to watch the insertion of the tube uh, past the soft tissue. So you're less likely to have any kind of an injury if you're otherwise distracted from watching the screen. Now, what, one final troubleshooting thing that I went through with you when I was um, was learning this technique was the problem because you're keeping the tip back from the molecular in someone with a large floppy lip epiglottis, the epiglottis flopping down and, and just obstructing my view. And your solution to that was incredibly simple. My... <laughs> Did I tell you about Indiana Indiana Jones and um, and when he the was confronting that guy with the turban and this wicked saw, uh, sword? And yeah. then all he did was pulled out the pistol and shot the guy. Um, I, I'm not suggesting you commit murder, but what I'm suggesting is if the epiglottis is in your way, just pick it up. 
Yeah, and that, and that seems for, for some reason it's funny how you get into a into a, a pattern of behaviour that certain things are allowed. That the epiglottis is there in your way, and you've got a device that could lift it. So essentially, just using it like you would a straight blade to lift up the epiglottis, exactly. and that that solves that problem. We're we're running right out of time, Richard. There were some other things I wanted to go through. Is there? Do you want to do it one last thing quickly before we wrap up? Have you got time to do one more? Sure. Is there anything else you'd like to go through? What, what did you do? You want to do the nasogastric tube? Uh, yeah, that's sure that would be fine. Yeah, um, routine or the special technique that I described to you? The, so the nasal let's do not nasotracheal. Would you rather do nasotracheal or nasogastric? Um, let, let's ask the audience to vote. Are there any more audience questions just before we go? I'm going to take that as a no. Okay, we're, Let's we're good go at the nasogastric. Let's go nasogastric. Okay, so just, just run us through what we're trying to achieve here, Richard. All right. So the endotracheal tube is already in situ. Your, your surgeon says, the stomach is, is getting in my way. I need it decompressed. You've put your fingers in the mouth and you're trying to advance a nasogastric tube and you're unsuccessful. Meanwhile, you've got these deep indentations in your index and middle finger from encountering the teeth underneath the drapes. So my suggestion is that you take your nasal, you take your laryngoscope and you visualize the uvula. Yeah. Okay, now take your nasogastric tube or have someone else insert a lubricated nasogastric tube. And I'm putting this in through the nose, yep. I'm and not, we'll wait until it- I'm not sure, I'm not sure this, oh, here we go. Points. Yeah. Okay, stop. Now reposition your, your laryngoscope so that it's posterior to the to the endotracheal tube. Okay, so I'm gonna lift the essentially lift the tube up with the exactly. Oops, hang on, I'm not doing this very well. Now it'll be pretty much deeper insertion than we had before, revealing the the esophagus. Now you'll advance the the nasogastric tube, and yeah. you can manipulate the. It's you know so often we end up seeing that the the reason we're having difficulty is the nasogastric tube is trying to go into the larynx. Yeah. So I'm, I'm we're suffering from a, a lack of lubrication we're here, but we're trying, we're rotating it. Yeah, I'm suffering a lack of lubrication, but I think you can see nicely here that you know again it's a it's a bit it's a bit shooting the swordsman again because your 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 instinct is once again to put the laryngoscope in like you usually would and have the the endotracheal tube obstructing your view and you just lifted it out of the way and you can see that you've got a great view there of the esoph right. upper esophageal sphincter and that if I was able to move that at all it's it's very sticky because I haven't put enough lube on it that you would be able to manipulate that now under vision and put it down. So we would probably we would try to to rotate that 180 degrees and, and eventually yeah. you'll get in probably to the lateral fornix and, and Yeah, I haven't put enough lube on it. I can't okay. I can't move it at all. But I but I think the, the point is made about how that would be useful, Richard. De definitely demonstrate that technique and it works very effectively. Fantastic. I'm afraid we're out of time. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I also would like to thank. Oh, the the other thing I want to do is is the gas pass the challenge. I forgot. Now we have to clarify what what this is. You and I disagree about what this is. Um, so so I, Richard showed me these techniques a, a bit over a year ago, and and really really the important part of this is that I think you commit to using a hyperangulated blade by default for an extended period to to get up the the skill set. Now I did that with the intent of, as Richard mentioned earlier, if you, if you don't get good at this, you won't have the skills to use it in the setting where you really need it. So most of the time you won't need the hyperangulated blade, but it does have some other benefits, I think even in a, in a routine setting. But if you don't, if you don't practice with it and, and get proficient with it, you won't be able to use it when it really counts. It's not something you can grab for the first time out of the drawer when you, when you hit a difficult airway. So Richard challenged me to sort of default to hyperangulated blade for somewhere between three months and a year. I, he may have said three months. I, I went, ended up going for a year. And, and, and though, though it wasn't the plan, the plan was for me to go back and then just keep my hand in by doing 
a couple of hyperangulated intubations a week, but I just thought it was such a better technique that I've stuck with it routinely now uh, as, as my default. I still go back and practice, occasionally deliberately practice um, Macintosh blade, direct laryngoscopy. So I'm sort of doing the opposite of what I'd intended to do now. I, I default to hyperangulated, but I keep my hand in with, um, with, um, with direct laryngoscopy. What I'd like to encourage you to do is, is to take on that, that challenge. For those of you wondering, wondering why it's the gas passer challenge, that is Richard's Twitter handle. Um, Richard, I think there's probably some, there's probably some important safety considerations in doing this if you're gonna start, start using this by default. Do you wanna give some caveats to the, to the gas, gas passer challenge? Okay, um, thank you. Uh, if you typically, if you have thought about using the hyperangulated blade as a rescue, I think uh, Nick attributes this to me. I don't actually remember having said it, but he regards this as a my, that my recommendation was a reverse rescue. So I would employ the hyperangulated blade in patients with a, with an obviously easy airway or an airway that doesn't seem to produce. It doesn't suggest that there are going to be anatomic or physiologic challenges. And then if you have difficulty, um, then you can revert to your, your more familiar technique so that you acquire your skill increasingly uh, on or initially on normal airways. And you find that with the passage of time that you progressively raise the bar so that you're prepared to challenge yourself more and more with the as you acquire the expertise. Okay, thanks for that, Richard. So we'd encourage you to go away and do that. And, and we might check in with people um, down the track who've taken on the gas passer challenge. Um, we'll just say goodbye to our trainees. So um, Matt and Alyssa, are you still there? Thank, I don't, you, you still got a bit of a funny picture there, <laughs> time lapsing there, but th thanks very much for joining us. I, th I hope you found that useful. And Carly, Carly and Curtis. Hi, thank you. Thank you for thank your time, you. it's much appreciated. That's great, thank you. Okay, and thank you very much, Richard. It's been a great pleasure to have you here with us to, to share, your, share your expertise. Oh, it's my pleasure, Nick. Thank you very much for having me. It's been, it's been great. Um, so I just remind everyone once again. <laughs> that's not my flow. <laughs> um, once again, I just remind you that this. Oh, how Ellen, Ellen's congratulate. We've had, I must say we've had great support from the the Universal Airway team. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, um, absolutely. Can I just encourage everyone out there to to support the society so that we can go on. Um, providing these sort of free educational resources for you. If you can jo join the society, um, the, we'll, we'll put some resources up. Richard, have you, have you got some good articles on um, video laryngoscopy that you could, you could send me a list of and I'll, I'll pop the links up to them on the, the website. That would okay. be fantastic. Um, our next episode of Airways will be in a couple of months. Um, we haven't really decided what that's gonna be on yet, but I'm, I'm, I'm hoping it will be, what is it now? January, so probably around March. So I look forward to seeing you then. Thank, thank you to everyone who's joined us today and we'll see you soon on Airwaves.